So for more on Tuesday's fall economic statement, we're going to turn to some experts. Jimmy Jean is the chief economist at Desjardins. Armin Yalnesian is the Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers at the Atkinson Foundation. It's good to speak with you both. You're going to join us tomorrow to react to this thing. But, but Jimmy, let, let's start with some pre-action. What do you make of what uh, Karina laid out just now? Money in tr form of loans uh, for, for rental housing construction, um, but no massive spending is what we're hearing at this point in time. Yeah, and I, I think this is the right approach. Uh, and I think on housing in general, they've been moving uh, pretty fast in, in recent months. Uh, and we're finally seeing some acceleration in the housing uh, accelerator fund. And it looks like there will be uh, a number of agreements uh, with uh, municipalities to tap into the $4 billion uh, fund. Uh, you know, there, there's also uh, speculation that uh, they, they, they could remove tax deductibility advantages for, for those owners of short-term rentals, as uh, was just described. So, uh, and, and, and this addition of providing, uh, you know, affordable loans for home builders, I think it comes to complement what has already been uh, done in terms of removing the GST and really speed up uh, those uh, purpose-built rental uh, construction. So I think it goes in the right direction. At the same time, there are loans, not uh, expenditures. Uh, so uh, I think those will uh, be, I think that you really have to focus on on housing, and that's what uh, this suggests. Yeah, pr presumably the, the loans uh, that, what, what is built with those loans would be the collateral uh, against it. So it would help on the balance sheet. Uh, Armin, uh, what's your sense of what we know so far? Because we always get a few details in advance of these big days. Uh, what's your take? It's hard to see that there, there will be any major surprises. What was interesting to me last year this time when they did their fall economic uh, statement, it was like a steady as she goes update uh, in the wake of a 40-year record high spike in inflation. And it was we didn't even get the so-called grocery rebate till the, uh, the budget the following spring. It was just mm. like, yeah, our number one concern is not blowing up the deficit which doesn't really speak to what the opposition is talking about. So the opposition comes in three different forms, people that are really struggling to keep a roof over their heads right now. And we're not talking about building affordable uh, apartments. We're talking about building apartments. And the problem is affordability, not just what kind of things that are being built, but who they're being built for. And that requires federal spending. You can't do that by just lending money to developers. And the second part is that, you know, the provinces want the feds to spend more, but the official opposition at the federal level does not want to spend more. So how's that going to play out? And how is this budget going to speak to the increased political pressure on this government to do something instead of just playing steady as she goes. To your point earlier, it doesn't look like we're going to get to a deficit of zero anytime. Yeah, it's not a big deal. But I think what's a big deal is in the wake of all of these unpredictable things that have emerged in the last few months, we are not looking possibly at a contingency. The Ontario government blew up, uh, you know, a, a federal, uh, sorry, a, a provincial deficit uh, from just a few hundred million dollars to $5.6 billion for a contingency that nobody can see coming. I mean, will the feds have a similar thing like that? The only surprise I can see will be how the books are presented to the public. But I think the way Karina has reported it is absolutely covers all the bases. So, so, so Jimmy, what, what would you hope to see there beyond what we already know uh, in terms of fiscal track, uh, fiscal anchor, preserving the AAA credit rating that, that is of critical importance to the federal government as it continues to borrow and add debt? Uh, what, what, do you, what would you like to see as, as a chief economist? Well, um, certainly a lot has been done. A lot has been uh, announced, uh, but uh, we've heard from uh, you know the Bank of Canada's governor, and certainly the the frustration is understandable because uh, you know right now we have a Bank of Canada discovering that uh, monetary and fiscal policy coordination only works in one direction, and actually the very reason we have an independent central bank uh, is because uh, political considerations will always dominate over the very difficult decisions that need to be taken. Uh, when you have to address economic overheating. Uh, you know, for example, we've seen Ontario extending its, its fuel tax break. We've seen Quebec with its larger than usual indexation of benefits. So it shows how really difficult it is to hold back when it comes to spending that's intended to address 
a, a hardship situation. But the reality is that, you know, for the Bank of Canada, uh, all dollars matter right now. It can be transfers to households or it can be home building subsidies. They will slow the return to a 2% inflation target. Uh, so it doesn't say that as governments shouldn't be undertaken those um, those measures, especially given the needs of a fast growing population. But it really means they have to make hard choices and really narrow down their priorities. Uh, they need to follow through and be seen as critical, credible because, uh, quite frankly, it's better for the Bank of Canada to issue this warning than for financial markets to start getting nervous. That's much less forgiving. Yes, uh, and I mean, we've spoken many times over the past little while of uh, your criticism of the, the Bank of Canada and how it's using monetary policy to uh, attack inflation when some of the issues, as you point out, are sort of beyond the reach of interest rates. But they have signaled this warning about government spending. But if you look at a note from like Scotiabank, a lot of the spending, like not the COVID spending, but the current spending from governments that's driving maybe basis points in the interest rate, it's coming from the provincial level and even the municipal level, not even necessarily the federal level. So what do you think Christian Freeland needs to do there tomorrow to sort of respond to the concerns that Tiff Macklem has laid out? Oh, I don't know how the two of them respond to each other's concerns. They have quite different jobs, as uh, Jimmy has pointed out. And I think the federal government needs to take more seriously some of the things it has done in the last couple of years to deal with the economic, not fiscal pressures, which, such as labor shortages, mm -hmm. where they've opened up the taps on newcomers. And that comes with a good side and a bad side. Yeah, you've got more workers, but those workers need a place to live. And they do put pressure on uh, more spending, which the Bank of Canada would like to see trimmed back. But how do you do that when you add over a million people? I, like, It's just... It, it doesn't square with the moment. It squares with economic uh, monetary theory that says all things stable, you shouldn't continue to add to spending. But if you're going to add um, over a million people to the equation, you're going to add spending. Mm. And we're doing that because businesses are saying we can't find people to do the work. So I think that that that's the double-edged sword that I think will not be addressed in the fall economic statement because it's such an incredibly difficult thing to solve. You push in the balloon on immigration and bring in fewer people, you've got more labor shortages. You push in the balloon on labor shortages, you've got more housing problems. This goes completely beyond interest rate policy to a policy of if you're gonna bring more people in, where are they supposed to live and how are you supporting that? So, and Jimmy, on that point, I mean, Christian Freeland quotes Janet Yellen a lot and talks about supply side economics to justify the investments in childcare, for example, and immigration numbers. It seems like their economic policy, industrial policy, as well as the clean transition, maybe collides with the monetary policy of the Bank of Canada, you know, and there's a tension there, right? So how do you try to address that tomorrow? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, the... When we look at the um, green uh, technology uh, subsidies, uh, you know there, there's a lot that's been done, and uh, but you know at the same time we don't know the full cost of uh, of, of what it will be. You know the the Volkswagen agreement was fully uh, accounted for, but uh, you still have Stellantis and and Northvolt to fully account for. Um, and, and you know how much exactly are we talking about when the spending is booked? Uh, we we don't know yet. There's things like changes to uh, home heating and fuel carbon taxes, uh, and very importantly, the increase in support to rural households as part of that package, how much that will cost. Uh, ultimately, uh, we talked earlier about the negotiations around a, a national pharma care plan. You know, 11 to 14 billion is the PBO's estimate for how much that would cost annually. So we're not going to see that being announced tomorrow at that price tag, but are there going to be other concessions to satisfy the NDP? Uh, that's always a possibility. So that's kind of what worries me is that, you know, there's so much uh, that's uh, unaccounted for in terms on the spending side. And we know that the economy is deteriorating. Canada's economic growth has basically stagnated. Uh, so pressures on the bottom line will continue to remain uh, important. And that's why uh, a really focused uh, approach when it comes to spending is necessary at this time. Okay. I mean, we got about 30 seconds left. You got a final point? Yeah, I do, actually. There's not just the pressure from the NDP, it's the pressure from the Conservatives. And it's not just the pressure of a declining economy and keeping a tight rein on spending. It's the pressure of a government that is responsible to prevent further decline by spending. So you know that's what happens when you're in government. You've got to work these two sides of the ledger. It isn't just about don't spend and everything will be fine. The problem is if you don't spend, how will things deteriorate?
that is also a relevant question. Yes, there's a cost to spending and there's a cost to not spending. It depends on, on how you tally and calculate those. All right, Armin Yalnizi and, and Jimmy Jean, we'll speak to you again tomorrow when we have all of the information and we can give a, a proper analysis. Thanks so much uh, for helping us set it up. Thank you for having us. Pleasure.